Good morning, church. It's so good to be together this morning. We want to welcome you if you're new here today or if you're watching online. We're going to have the best day together. Come on.
Just as he said
church. My name is Hannah and I'm one of the youth pastors here at Chesterfield and um, I just want to ask you a question this morning and I wonder for those of you that drive, have any of you ever been on a journey on your own where you have completely relied on your sat nav for directions? Anybody in there? A few people agreeing. Well, I can remember the first journey that I ever did on my own and I was driving to a friend's house in Leeds, which I think I was quite brave going quite a long way on my own for the first time. But I can remember I was completely reliant on the sat nav because I didn't have anyone else in the car with me to direct me. And um, it got to a point where I was almost at my friend's house and it reminded me this morning actually because I came across a road closed sign. And this morning there have been them everywhere. Um, but I came across this road closed sign and in that moment I panicked. And I didn't know what to do because I didn't have anything else to rely on. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know my surroundings. I didn't know exactly where I was going. And you know what it reminded me? Sometimes in life, we can hit road, clo road closures. We can hit obstacles. We can hit mountains in our lives when maybe life doesn't go exactly the way we planned. Maybe we come across a situation. Maybe someone in our family gets sick or we struggle financially or a relationship breaks down, whatever that may be, and it doesn't quite go our way. It doesn't quite go the way that we planned or the way that we thought. And I want to encourage us this morning. God, God's way is higher and His ways are greater. And it says this in Isaiah. In Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are, my, are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. 
This morning we serve a God that is greater. We serve a God who does know the way. Even when we get to a closed road, even when we face an obstacle, our God will get us through. Our God will get us to that final destination. Our God will bring the victory. He will bring the breakthrough. So this morning, church, whatever obstacle we may face in our lives, we need to lift them to God and we need to declare whether we are at a mountain top or we are in a valley, that we are going to praise and that we are going to trust and we are going to declare that God's ways are higher, that His thoughts are greater and that He is the God above all. So come on, let's worship this morning, church, and let's lift His praises.
I love this song. I, I love it because it kind of starts as a prayer, come do something new. But then it ends with a declaration of faith that says, here comes something new. That the, the, the new we're asking for, the new we're longing for, that God is hearing and God is answering. And uh, it's written by our guys here for our Vision Sunday earlier in the year. And it'll be on our new album out in two weeks. So that's pretty cool. And uh, so, so look out for that. And uh, I, I'm not going to give anything away because I'm not, I'm not sure what I should give away or not give away. But anyway, we've got a new album coming out in a couple of weeks. And uh, it's fantastic. But it's so good to be together today. Like massive well done for <laughs> getting around those marathon roads. Uh, I was talking to somebody, you know, in the foyer, just like they saying, I've just no idea where I've been this morning, but I'm here. So that's fantastic. And uh, if you're new today, if you made it and you're new, we just want to give you a huge welcome this morning to Icon Church. Not just, not just because you got around all those roadworks or anything, but we just love to welcome new people and uh, welcome home. And we believe that not only can this be a home for many people, but it can be a home for you. And also we want to say you belong here. We believe that with all our heart. We take a moment in all our services to pray, to pray for people's needs and to give thanks to God for answered prayer. And we've got a lot of prayer requests. I think they'll come on the screen and uh, we're just going to pray in a moment and pray for people. These are things that people have just asked us to pray for, specific things that people are going through. But you may have things in your world, in your life. This is a moment for you to pray and for you to just lift them to God. And as we lift them to God together, I believe God hears and God answers prayer. So come on, let's pray. Just why don't you pick one of these and just pray in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you that this morning we're in your house. We thank you that we can declare uh, in prayer, come do something new. And then we can declare in faith, here comes something new. And so we pray for all these prayer requests today. We pray for healing. We pray for restored relationships. We pray for financial provision. Father God, we ask you to move in people's lives today. And as people Today, as individuals, we're lifting up our prayer requests, salvation for friends and relatives in our lives. Father God, we're asking you, come do something new. Come and work in these situations. I pray for any person in this service, Father God, who needs a touch from you today, maybe, maybe healing today, maybe you to speak to them today. We thank you for it. We believe for it, God, as we worship you and as we turn to your word in just a few moments. We believe that you are here and that you answer our prayers and that you are going to do incredible incredible things today in Jesus mighty name and the whole church said amen come on let's worship together as we sing, as we Praise report as well. Somebody thanking God that my tooth was not broken. They've been in pain for weeks, but they're so glad that the tooth wasn't broken. And hopefully that means they're pain-free now and it's all got sorted. Uh, thanking God for that. Come on, why don't we thank God with them? This Hello, welcome to Icon Church Online. My name is Gavin. And my name's Jane, and we are two of the pastors here at Icon Church. We hope that you're enjoying the service so far. And in a moment, we will be going back to the service for today's message. Before we do that, we want you to feel a part of the family. We have a slogan that says, you belong here, and we truly mean that. Yes, we want you to know that we're here for you, and we'd love to hear from you. You can send us prayer requests, 
to us via the chat section or speak to one of our online pastors during the service. Or you can use the drop down menu and contact us at any time. Yes, we'd love to pray for you and with you and see God do amazing things in your life. You can also give and support this online ministry via the drop down should you want to. So right now we're going back into the service and preparing to receive all that God wants to do in today's message. We know that you're going to enjoy today's message. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, wow, thank you. You lot are amazing. You can grab your seats. Why don't we thank the band? Didn't they do a great job? Here comes something new. Man, that is a fabulous song. And uh, I believe it's a prophetic statement for this church. How many know our nation needs something new? We are in a battle as a nation. And uh, I believe it's never been a better time for the church to be full of hope, full of faith, to make a difference. And... So good to be here. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Steve, and I'm married to the most beautiful girl in the world, and she'll be here tonight, so make sure you come back, and uh, she's a great preacher, but I really feel it's my honor to be here with you guys. I genuinely do. I've only known uh, your pastors for a year, but when I pulled up this morning, I just feel excited to be in this church. It's the third time I've been here now, and uh, I always feel genuinely excited for what God is doing here. Every time I speak to people around the country about the Bengers, they instantly say, oh, we love Paul and Jeannie. They are deeply loved around the country. And I, I guess I personally have discovered why that is a little bit this year. They are spiritually, you know, strong and deep. Uh, they are smart leaders. But most of all, they really love people. And they really love their church. And so why don't you give it up for your pastors that do such a great job. And a big welcome to uh, Sheffield. I had a beautiful drive into Derbyshire. The countryside here is absolutely stunning in Derby. Uh, in Sheffield, the beauty is in its people. And uh, so it's great to see all the beautiful people. And hope you really enjoy the service this morning because God wants to speak to you whether you're there in Sheffield, whether you're here in this service, or whether you're listening online. God wants to speak to us. So have you got hearts that are ready and expectant? So come on, let's pray. Father, we want to thank you that this is your word. These are your people and it's your church. And so we pray for everybody that's listening into this message and ask, Lord, that you will speak to us and speak through me what is on your heart for your people. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Now, if you are new here or in Sheffield, we again want to extend the biggest, warmest welcome to you. If you're not part of a church, this is a great church to be in. So come on, church, why don't we welcome one more time anyone that is new. question to the church. It's a question we've been asking ourselves for the last few months in Soul Church in Norwich, and it's this. Are we building a cruise ship church or a battleship church? As a believer, are you rocking back on a cruise ship or are you standing up and ready for the fight on a battleship? On 21st of October, 1805, Admiral Lord Nelson sailed into battle aboard HMS Victory against the combined might of the French and Spanish Navy. The odds were stacked against him. Nelson was outnumbered. There were 30,000 men against his 17,000. It was certain that some of Nelson's ships would face impossible odds. And as the two great fleets drew closer, anxiety began to build amongst the officers and the sailors. The fate of England rested on an unlikely hero, the son of a vicar from Norfolk. 
He entered the Navy aged 12 years of age. And he suffered from violent seasickness all of his life. He was wounded many times in combat. He lost the sight in his right eye in Corsica, age 36, and he lost his right arm when he was 40 years of age. He was only small in stature at five foot five, but on the inside, he was a giant. When he lost his right arm in battle, it was removed in an operation undertaken without any anesthetic. As a child, he's reputed to have said to his grandfather, fear. I never saw fear. What is it? Aboard HMS Victory, one British soldier, as the fleets approached, wrote this. During this momentous preparation, the human mind has ample time for meditation. For it was evident that the fate of England rested on this battle. If Nelson was to lose, it was certain that Napoleon Bonaparte would invade England as he had done many other nations and we would all be speaking French and eating snails and frogs' legs and we don't want that, do we? (laughs) We've never enjoyed being ruled by Europe. (laughs) Just a little joke, everyone. At 11.45, as the battleships engaged in the Battle of Trafalgar, Nelson sent his famous flag signal, England expects that every man will do his duty. Vice Admiral Collingwood said to his officers, now gentlemen, let us do something today which the world may talk of hereafter. How great would it be, Icon Church? If we did something in this city and in Sheffield and the cities of the middle of England that in future generations they will talk what we did. Lord Nelson's victory aboard HMS Victory Trafalgar secured his position. He was unquestionably the greatest military hero Britain ever produced. He is the personification of heroism. And this morning we're going to board that famous battleship. HMS Victory as a church, and journey together and learn some lessons of what it means to be a battleship believer. So come on, who's up for the fight this morning there in Sheffield? So point number one, if you're making notes, battleship believers are assured of the certainty and the totality of victory. The Battle of Trafalgar, the British ships were vastly outnumbered. But they managed to destroy 22 of the French and the Spanish ships. Do you know how many ships we lost? Zero. It was an incredible victory. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ Jesus. A couple of months ago, I was walking through W.H. Smith's in an airport and I picked up this. It was... National Geographic, a history edition. And it's entitled Caesar's Triumphs. And it tells the story of what triumphs meant in the Roman world. Some of you will be familiar with this. When a Roman general went out to war, if they were to win a great victory, they would apply to the Senate for a victory parade known as a triumph. If the Senate deemed their victory was not sufficiently comprehensive, the general would be granted a lesser honor known as an ovation. To qualify for a full-blown triumph, a series of conditions had to be met. The general had to win a major battle. The general had to comprehensively defeat the enemy with a minimum of 5,000 enemy casualties. And thirdly, the general's actions had to end the war. So the Bible doesn't say, thanks be to God who always leads us to an ovation in Christ. It's very intentional. It says, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph. 
What does that mean? Jesus has won a major battle. The enemy has been comprehensively defeated and his actions ended the war and assured us a victory. On the cross, he said, it is finished. He didn't say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. And he always leads us in triumph. You say, how does that happen? Two things. Number one, he has armed you and he has disarmed the enemy. Psalm 1839 says, you have armed me with strength for the battle. Colossians 2.15, in this way he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them and publicly by his victory over them on the cross. I'm so glad this morning, church, Icon Church, we don't sail in HMS defeat, HMS overwhelmed. We are riding together in HMS victory. Come on, why don't we give the Lord an ovation? Number two, battleship believers lead others in triumph. It says, now thanks be to God who leads us in triumph in Christ Jesus and through us. Let's look around you through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. If that's how God leads us into victory, that's how we should lead others into victory. One of my heroes is Pastor Brian Houston of Hillsong Church. and I, I'm a little bit nerdy when it comes to preaching. I collect books and definitions of preaching. And a few years ago, he was teaching the staff on preaching and he, he said this, Preaching is giving people a stepladder to victory. When he said that, it just arrested my attention. And I thought, isn't that what all of us should be doing? Giving people a stepladder from the pain of this world and their families and all that's going on. We give people a stepladder to victory. And through us, the Bible said, he diffuses the smell of victory. You know, Our strongest sense is the sense of smell, especially my wife. Any wives out there with a strong sense of smell? And we lived in Australia for 16 years and some friends visited us and uh, we had a great time with them and they had a little kid and when they left, they decided to leave a a nappy wrapped in plastic and they stuffed it down the back of our headboard where we couldn't see it. Yeah, exactly. Ooh. And after about a month, my wife start, she'd jump into bed, she'd be going, and then she'd look at me. <laughs> and I'm like, Whoa. and then after about six weeks, she, she'd, she'd lean over and she'd start smelling me. <laughs> and then she'd say things like, have you had a shower? All right. Ever had that feeling with the missus? And I'm like, it's not me. I've had a shower. And, and eventually one, one night she couldn't sleep. It was like two o'clock in the morning. She said, I've got to find this. She jumps out of bed, starts ripping everything off the bed and the mattress. And there we found the nappy, which by now was black on the inside. It absolutely stunk. You know, victory has a smell. I, uh, one of my kids is really competitive. And so uh, we used to play games in the pool in Australia. And every time I was about to beat her, I'd go, can you smell that, Mercy? She'd say, what? I said, it's the sweet smell of victory. But you probably can't smell it. And I would wind her up and she'd become more competitive. You know, in life, you can give off a smell. Is it the smell of decay and defeat? Or is it the sweet smell of victory? A couple of weeks ago, we, uh, we went to... To Neil Cameron's, it's a church in Peterhead. I know Pastors Paul and Jeannie know them really well. And, and uh, they go to America a lot from Peterhead. They've got family there. And as soon as we walked into their house, Rachel was, oh, what's that smell? It's, it's awesome. If you've ever been to a place called Cracker Barrel in America, it smelled like that, cinnamon and apples. And, and what it was is all around their house, they had these. And they're made by Yankee Candle. And what you do is you put these around the house and you put them on a radiator. And everywhere we went, we could smell all these Tuscan village and cinnamon apple. And there was one called hope. I thought, what a smell to give off. What a smell to diffuse through, through the house. The smell of hope, the smell of victory. Question, what smell do you give out? 
when you walk into a church, when you walk into your workplace, when you leave a copy online, a, a comment online on Facebook or Instagram, is it the sweet smell of victory or is it the scent of death and decay? I believe as a church, we're called to be diffusers of a new scent and a new smell, and it's of His victory and His love and His hope. Number three, battleship believers know how to celebrate and practice generosity. The most famous Roman triumph recorded in history and in this National Geographic was when the Emperor Pompey the Great the Roman historian Plutarch records that he was awarded a triumph and a two-day party in AD 61, sorry, BC 61. He rode into the city of Rome on a golden chariot studded with diamonds. He paraded 300 high-ranking hostages and he displayed placards boasting that he'd killed or captured 12 million enemies, sunk 864 warships. And as he paraded through the city, he threw parties and banquets and games. And Pompey gave 1,500 denarii to each of his soldiers. The equivalent of 10 years of wages. Talk about radical generosity. So take your salary right now and times it by 10. How many would love that as a Christmas bonus? <laughs> That's what happened. Because battleship believers, uh, we don't think small when it comes to generosity. There's a radicalness to it. I've got a friend, he's a pastor in America, sorry, in Australia. His name is Joel Cave. And he was telling me this week that they started in the Gold Coast six years ago. They've got a church now of 3,000 people. They started in Sydney. They get over 500 people. And they're about to start in Melbourne. And they had 100 people 180 people gathered in groups, and so they're about to launch their church in the new year. And he was down at a gathering with a company of people. There's a guy there. He's an Aussie guy, and he said, I've just sold my company in America for $50 million, uh, and I've moved back to my roots in, in Melbourne. And so Joel was talking to this guy. He says, well, we're about to launch our church in a few weeks' time. What are you going to do to help us? And he said, Steve, we ask people to step up into leadership or to lead a connect group. But when it comes to finance, sometimes as Brits, we're a little bit backwards and a little bit reserved. And he said, he eyeballed this guy. He said, well, you've just sold it for 50 million. What are you going to do to help us change the city of Melbourne? And he left the conversation. The next day, that guy went in to the bank account and deposited a significant sum of money. Radical generosity. I wonder what is God challenging you to do? When I moved to Brisbane, we, we took on a church there of 2,000 people. Today, it's 7,000 people with nine different locations. And every year, people have given radically. And the, the oversight is a guy called Steve Dixon. He's from Stockport. And when I first went to work with him, he said, Steve, if we're going to do something here in Brisbane, we've got to get two things right. Number one, you've got to get the people right. Look after people, care for them. Number two, you've got to get the finances right. Because finance allows us to take massive strides forwards in reaching people, or lack of finance can hold us back. As Rise and Build comes next week, what an opportunity for us to put a stake in the ground in Chesterfield, in Sheffield, in every location. Say, devil, we are serious. We are taking ground. Something new. So what is the Holy Spirit whispering to you, to your family, to do, to go where we've never gone? Sometimes we've got to do what we've never done. We've got to give what we've never given. Believing it's going to catapult you forward as a church. Man, Chesterfield needs this. It needs a beautiful group of people like you guys are to be family to them. Number four, battleship believers speak the language of victory. Nelson inspired his troops with the famous words, England expects. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Your words can inspire people to victory or condemn them to defeat. 
President Kennedy, when he presented Churchill with the honorary American citizen, citizenship, quoted Edward R. Murray. He's the full quote that Murray made in 1940 when Churchill came to take on and lead and change the morale of a nation. He said the hour had come for Churchill to mobilize the English language and send it into battle. A spearhead of hope for Britain and the world. It lifted the hearts of an island of people when they stood alone. If ever our nation needs a spearhead of hope, if ever they need their hearts lifting, it is now, church. Let's speak a new language. Let's not just learn Spanish. Let's learn the language of victory and hope and possibility. Yeah, right. Britain needs it more than ever. So how's your language? How fluent are you in the vocabulary of victory? Does your language lift the hearts of people? Mark 1, verse 1, it talks about the beginning of the good news of the gospel, Jesus Christ. And I love the phrase, the gospel. I don't know whether you've ever studied that phrase, the gospel, but in Greek, it's a strange word, evangelion, from which we get the English word evangelism. And we're unfamiliar with the concept of what it meant, but if you were to live in Rome in the first century and you were shopping at, you know, shopping at George of Asda or Giorgio Armani, whichever you choose to shop at, all right? If you were shopping and all of a sudden you might hear somebody burst into the market square and they'd be shouting this, good news, good news, good news. And everybody would stop what they were doing and they would listen to the herald. And the herald, herald would have heard of what had gone on in the battle, where the Romans were fighting in England or in Egypt or wherever it was. But the news trickled back via the herald who would announce it in the marketplace with gospel, 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 good news. A victory has been won. The enemy has been defeated. If ever there was a time for the people of England to hear good news, good news, good news, it's now. We need to be telling the world more than ever what Jesus has done. The good news of lives healed, families made whole. HMS Victory survived being hit 90 times in the Battle of Trafalgar. Survived one of Hitler's bombs. It's the only ship to have survived the 250 years, the battleships of the line, as they're called. Only one in the world. There's only one thing that nearly took her out. It's called the Death Watch Beetle. I've got a picture of it on the screen. It's an interesting little animal because it lives in Deadwood. And it eats away the inside of the dead wood, the wood that's no longer alive, no longer full of life. Have you ever met dead wood in church? No longer contributing, no longer giving, no longer serving. And it's said that if you were to be in a large house in the countryside in the summer in England, you'll hear a little tapping sound because England is a very superstitious place it's said that if you hear the tapping sound of the death watch beetle you're about to die it's very positive isn't it yeah. <laughs> but I wonder how often in churches amongst the dead wood there's the tapping of gossip negativity, undermining our leaders, and it leads to the death of churches. Let's make sure that we're protecting ourselves against the words of defeat, the words of death, the words of decay, the words of the death watch beetle. Never listen to gossip against leaders. Never listen to people that think they understand why your senior leaders make decisions. You see, most people see this part of the picture. They usually see this part of the picture. If you're only seeing this part, don't start giving it this. Well, why are they doing that? 
We're not on a cruise ship. We're on a battleship. In a cruise ship, you can talk like that. Oh, did you hear what went on in the apartment last night? Oh, that sounded a bit frisky. You can talk like that on a cruise ship. You don't talk like that on a battleship. You're one and there's a spirit of unity. When you're on a cruise ship and the captain comes across the tannoy and says at three o'clock we're going to have arts and crafts. I don't worry about that stuff when I'm on a cruise ship. I'm happy to fall asleep. I don't need to listen to the captain. But when you're on a cruise ship, on a battleship, you'd better listen to what the captain tells you because it's a life and death issue. Number five, battleship believers understand the power of calling. You know, the truth is you don't go on a battleship over a cruise ship. You'd be mad to unless you're called to. Why would you go on a battleship when you could live on a cruise? Who would rather be on a cruise ship? To be honest, I would rather be on a cruise ship. But you know what? I'm called to be on a battleship. I don't have a choice in it. Never lose touch with your calling. And I believe there's a new sound going out across England. And it's a calling for a new breed of church. Something new is coming. All right, I know I love the way Jesus was constantly called Peter. When he called, when he called Peter in John 1 42, Andrew was the spiritual one. And he brought Peter to meet Jesus. You've got to meet him. You've got to. But Peter was wild. He was loud mouthed. He was opinionated. And Jesus looks at him and said, Oh, you're Simon, the son of John or Jonah in some. Son of Jonah kept running away. That's who you are, but then Jesus says, but you will be called Cephas, which means rocky. Jesus sees beyond who you are, and he sees what you will be. In the Bible, time and time again, changes the name of a person because it's a change of calling. Why was HMS Victory called HMS Victory? Explain why. Her name was chosen in 1760. And her name was given because in 1759, as part of the Seven Years' War with the Americans, the British had a series of amazing victories, land victories at Quebec and Minden, but also incredible naval victories at Lagos and Quiberon Bay. And so it became known as the Annus Mirabilis. I said to our church, it's Annus, not Anus. The Annus Mirabilis, just in case you're dyslexic. It means literally the year of miracles and the year of wonders. And so they called her HMS Victory. And I'm believing for Icon Church that this next year is going to be a year of wonders, a year of miracles, and a year of victories. Going quickly now, number six, we're in a battleship, we're battleship believers on a flagship battleship. Within the British Navy, there were three tiers of ratings. There were third-rate battleships, second-rate battleships, and first-rate battleships. To qualify as a first-rate battleship, you needed a hundred guns. But even within the first rate, there was one ship that was very special. It was known as the flagship. It was usually the largest, the most powerful, and the most heavily armed. But within it, there was required to be a large room. And in that large room, when they led the fleet, other leaders and other captains would sit around with the admiral And communication would go out from that room via the flags to the rest of the fleet. And HMS Victory was not only first rate, she was a flagship. And on a flagship, you have to be a little bigger, you have to think a little bigger, and you have to serve a little bigger. And I believe that God has called Icon Church not to be a third-rate church, not to be a second-rate church. You're called to be a first-rate church. And I believe to be a flagship church in our nation. And I believe you already are, but it is only going to increase. That in the future, pastors and leaders are going to come from afar and going to say, and sit down with your leaders and say, how did you do that? And so, church, are we ready 
to be on that flagship church. Because when you're on a cruise ship, other people come and serve you. But when you're on a battleship, you serve other people. You're not there for you as a consumer. You are there as a contributor. I believe God has called you as a flagship church. Number seven, real quick. Battleship believers may get wounded, but they never develop a wounded spirit. Maybe as the team come. HMS Victory was hit 96 times, the Battle of Trafalgar. She didn't sink. Church life, you may get hit. Just make sure you don't sink. It's inevitable that you'll get hit. Nelson, in previous battles, he'd lost an eye and an arm. Yet still God used him. Friend, you don't need to be perfect. It's not a perfect, maybe a flagship church, but it's not a perfect church. God takes imperfect people to do incredible things. But here's a bit of wisdom for you. God can use wounded people, but never develop a wounded spirit. Some of us, we've got to toughen up. Proverbs 18 verse 14 says, The spirit of a man will sustain him in infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear. Don't let stuff get inside. Then lastly, battleship believers practice humility. Practice humility. The Romans, the Senate distrusted monarchies and emperors. They didn't want emperor, they didn't want generals feeling like they were a king. They'd become a republic and they didn't mind them being a king for a day. And so when Pompey rode through the streets of Rome, a golden chariot studded with diamonds with the cloak of Alexander the Great and a victory wreath called a Stephanos on his head. As he rode through the streets, history tells us, riding on the chariot behind him was a slave. And the slave would whisper into the ear, As the crowds adored him and cheered him, he whispered in Pompey's ear, remember this, you're just a man. You're just a man. May the Holy Spirit constantly whisper in our ears, we're only human. We need him. We need his strength and his power. 21st of August, October 1805, when Lord Nelson sailed into battle. He saved Britain from certain defeat, but I didn't tell you one highly significant detail. At 8 a.m., Lord Nelson went down into his cabin in HMS Victory. He knelt down and he said this prayer. May the great God whom I worship grant to my country And for the benefit of Europe in general, a great and glorious victory. And may humanity after victory be the predominant feature in the British fleet. For myself individually, I commit my life to Him who made me. Amen. 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 May we always have a spirit of humility that's willing to get on our knees and say, God, have your way. May we pray like never before, church. At 11.48, while the drums began to beat the call to action, Lord Nelson ordered the famous signal England expects. Battle of Trafalgar was a truly terrifying experience. We can scarcely comprehend. 4,716 cannons firing 32-pound balls of iron. It took 12 men to hold a gun. It could project that piece of iron 1.3 miles. And yet they faced each other from point-blank distance. So as cannonballs and musket balls crashed into the ships, The splinters flew like bullets, killing many men. Fires broke out. There were infernos. Most of the British fleet couldn't even swim. Many drowned. We have no idea 
the pain that went on in those Navy battles. Nelson stepped aboard HMS Victory wearing four silver stars embroidered on his suit in a bright red uniform, the gold sparkling in the sun. The French sniper shot a bullet 0.69 inches in diameter, pierced his left shoulder. It broke his back. It ruptured an artery. He said to his surgeon, I felt my back break. It was a slow and painful death. As he lay dying, Lord Nelson said, Thank God I have done my duty. Closed his eyes and at 3.30 in the afternoon spoke his last words. God and my country. Nelson's body was placed in a cask of brandy mixed with myrrh and returned to England. Exhausted, though victorious, Soldiers reported a strange combination of joy and loss. Unable to reconcile the completeness of the victory with the sadness of his death. Henry Blackwood reported, I found Lord Nelson at the gasp of death. Thank God he lived to know that such victory never before was granted. As battleship believers, may we always remember the completeness of our victory and the means by which it was achieved. Such victory never before was granted. As we look at the screens, it was accomplished through the death, the willing sacrifice of our Lord, not Lord Nelson but the Lord Jesus Christ who laid down His life for you. And for you, friend, in Sheffield, He died. He died so that you can be saved. He died so that you can be made whole. He gave His life because He loved you so much. But thank God the story doesn't end with His death. The story ends with the resurrection of Jesus who comes to give you life. And He's here in this service this morning, friend. He's here. Whether you're listening online or whether you're here, He wants to have a relationship with you. So before I hand over back to our pastors, and let me ask you this question. Are you in a right relationship with Jesus? Are you in a right place with Him? Maybe you're here and you, you think relig- Christianity is a religion and it's all about all the things you have to do. I've got to do this and I've got to be. No, it's not about what you do. Friend, it's about what He has done. It's what He has done on the cross and through the resurrection for you. Maybe you're here and there was a time when you once walked with God, but if you're really honest, you kind of drifted away. You've done your own thing. Friend, God still loves you. And right now, He's reaching out to you here and in Sheffield. And He's saying, hey, this morning it's time to come home, to get right with me. And so I'm going to pray a prayer. You say, Steve, how do I get right with God? How do I get into this right relationship? Friend, you say a prayer and you open your heart and He comes in. I'm going to close this part of the service by praying that prayer. I'm going to ask everyone in Sheffield and here in Chesterfield, I'm going to ask you just to bow your heads and close your eyes. Friend, this is a moment between you and God. If you know you need to get right with God, I want you to pray this prayer. So are you ready? All across this room and that room in Sheffield, just repeat this prayer after me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I need you. I invite you to come into my heart. I want to live for you with your help and strength. I'm sorry for my sin. Would you give me a new start from this moment forward? In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Amen. Come on, church. I know that either here or in Sheffield, people will have prayed that prayer. Pastor Paul will come and give you some instruction. But why don't we first congratulate, put our hands together, all those people who prayed that prayer. Yeah, we're just going to close by singing a song. Why don't we just stand together? If you prayed that prayer this morning, what we'd love you to do, we'd love to give you a Bible. We've got some Bibles you can pick up on the way out or in the foyer. We'd love to do that. And uh, one of our team will be there. Just go and get one. There's a sign there that says Bible Pickup Point. We'd love you uh, to get hold of that. Just before we sing, why don't we thank Steve? What an incredible message this morning. What an incredible message this morning. Uh, don't forget church, uh, Rachel's going to be preaching tonight, speaking tonight, it's going to be a great end to our day, so if you can get back at 6 o'clock, that would be fantastic. Come on, let's just worship God as we close this service. Oh, praise the Lord.